My name is Ima Ramos. I'm the curator of the Medieval to Modern South Asia collections here at the museum, and this is my corner. At the moment, I'm working on an exhibition, Tantra Enlightenment Revolution. I'm often asked, what exactly is Tantra? And first of all, I have to start with what it's not. It's not a hedonistic cult of ecstasy. It's actually a philosophy that emerged in India around the sixth century, and it presented a new affirmative worldview that all material reality is animated by Shakti, which translates as divine feminine power. This power could be accessed through the body and mind and through a range of rituals such as visualizations and yoga. And the ultimate aim was to reach spiritual enlightenment. This appealed to people from many different social backgrounds from across India, such as kings and queens, monks and nuns, householders and ritual specialists. The exhibition I'm working on presents a history of Tantra as a fundamentally countercultural movement. One of the recurring themes explores how Tantra's emphasis on divine feminine power informed the rise of goddess worship and how this in turn affected the lives of real women. So today I wanted to highlight a few objects that help us tell that story. The goddesses that Tantra inspired challenged traditional models of womanhood as passive and docile by expressing both maternal and destructive power. The goddess Kali illustrates this tension perfectly. Throughout history, she has been regarded as both a protective mother and a revolutionary icon by her devotees. This figure dates to the late 19th century and was made in Bengal, which was an early centre of Tantra. Clay sculptures of the goddess like this are made every year in Bengal for the annual Kali festival, which takes place every autumn. It's one of the biggest festivals in the region. They're housed in temporary shrines which are set up on street corners and devotees visit each one providing the goddess with offerings. It's believed that images of Kali become enlivened when ritually venerated in this way. A garland of severed heads hangs from her neck, corpses from her ears and hands from her girdle. In her upper left hand she would have carried a sword, now lost. The lower left hand carries a severed head. Her mouth is smeared with blood and she sticks out her tongue as though thirsting for more. Tantric texts describe her as having a gaping mouth with which she devours negative and demonic forces. Though she appears fierce, she also conveys compassion and a desire to assist her followers on their path to spiritual enlightenment. The severed heads that she wears and carries represent the fragile human ego which she helps her devotees to transcend. And her top right hand displays a gesture of fearlessness to reassure and protect her devotees. She's shown standing on her husband, the god Shiva. According to tantric belief, existence itself results from the erotic union between Shakti as creative force embodied here by Kali and Shiva as pure consciousness. The symbolism of Kali striding over Shiva reflects her superiority, as without her he would remain inert and the universe itself would perish. Shiva is literally a Shava or corpse without Kali, which is emphasised here by his deathly pallor. Kali's popularity became a focus for revolutionary politics at the time when this sculpture was made. It entered the museum in 1894, and we don't know who donated it, but it was probably a Christian missionary or colonial official who was based in Bengal at the time. During this period in the late 19th century, Bengal was not just a tantric centre, it was also the nucleus for British rule. Kali gripped the British psyche as an icon of horror and irrationality. Colonial officials completely misunderstood her symbolism and assumed she was demonic. Indian revolutionaries in Bengal effectively exploited British fears and misconceptions of the goddess as a bloodthirsty demon mother and harnessed her as an anti-colonial symbol. We can see this through this particular print produced around 1895 by a studio in Calcutta, the capital of Bengal. 
Carly's sacrificial heads assumed an alternative meaning here. A colonial administrator anxiously described this image as featuring what appeared to be British-looking heads, a prediction of the fall of the British Empire, which led to its censorship. Perhaps he was right to be concerned. By this time, Kali was regarded by many as a symbol of Mother India rising up against her colonisers. In 1905, a writer for a Bengali seditious newspaper proclaimed, Rise up, O sons of India. The foreign empire draws to an end, for behold, Kali rises in the east. I think it's this synthesis of modern politics and religious myth that make these two images of Kali so fascinating. Tantra's affirmation of the divine feminine was radical for its time, but how did this inform the lives of real women? Earlier Hindu and Buddhist traditions taught that the female body was an impediment to achieving enlightenment and that women should remain submissive and dependent on men. Tantra, on the other hand, taught that women could achieve rapid enlightenment because they were natural embodiments of Shakti. Many tantric texts even say that for this reason, women should be venerated as goddesses in their own right. The ultimate aim of tantric practice is to become a deity like Kali, to fully internalize their power. Tantric images re-envisioned women as independent practitioners who were capable of achieving self-deification. We see this through the historical figure of Karaika Amaya, who lived in Tamil Nadu in South India in the 6th century. According to popular accounts of her life, she was a very beautiful, very dutiful wife, but she was harboring a desire to pursue her own radical spiritual quest. She eventually abandoned her role as an obedient wife to become a follower of the god Shiva. She asked Shiva to replace her beauty with a fearsome appearance, which echoed Kali's. This is a modern representation of her that we have in the collection. For the exhibition, we're lucky enough to be including a medieval sculpture of her from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Here you can see that she's assumed that fierce appearance. She's skeletal and has bulbous eyes and fangs. She's shown reciting one of her visionary poems, accompanying herself with a pair of symbols. In one of her poems, she describes her time spent meditating in a cremation ground, Kali's favorite haunt, where she confronts and conquers her own ego and fear of mortality. In the cremation ground where you hear crackling noises and the white pearls fall out of the tall bamboo, the ghouls with frizzy hair and drooping bodies, shouting with wide open mouths, come together and feast on the corpses. In rejecting her social role and assuming a transgressive tantric one, she achieved an enlightened state. Today, she's regarded as both a devotional and tantric icon and is venerated as a saint across Tamil Nadu. Women played important roles, not only as independent masters, but also as tantric gurus or teachers who initiated disciples and shared otherwise secret teachings with them, including rituals for achieving union with a deity and access to a range of powers including the promise of immortality and even the ability to fly. This painting from around 1750 shows a noble woman who has traveled a great distance to visit two female tantric masters who were seated on the left. She appears to be seeking counsel or initiation from the elder woman whose age is expressively suggested with sensitive attention to detail. Many tantric texts describe women as superior teachers in their embodiment of Shakti. One example says that there are no rules for women. All are said to be gurus. The two female tantric masters on the left have long dreadlocks. One is wearing them piled on top of her head. They're both wearing small horns around their necks, which identifies them as members of the Nat order a tantric community founded around the 12th century. 
The Nat Order famously popularized tantric yoga, which involved awakening an individual source of Shakti at the base of the spine through breath control. This awakening was believed to trigger instant enlightenment and offer a range of other powers, from long life to invulnerability. Rulers across India were attracted to tantric masters as agents of power who could strengthen and lend authority to their political positions. This included the Mughal dynasty who arrived from Central Asia in the 16th century. They commissioned some of the earliest detailed representations of women as gurus, such as this one. The images that we have seen represent goddesses and women that transcend conventional representations of femininity and womanhood, whether as wife, mother or lover, by inhabiting a role beyond the parameters of societal expectations. From its beginnings to the present day, Tantra has challenged not only gender norms, but also religious, cultural and political establishments. The exhibition charts Tantra's potential for opening up new ways of seeing and changing the world. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Tantra, click here for a virtual tour of the show. And to find out more about the exhibition, see the details below.